This is A New Angle, a show about cool people doing awesome things in and around Montana. I'm your host, Justin Angle. This show is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. Hey folks, welcome back, and thanks for tuning in. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Larone Martin, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute at Stanford University. You think you know Martin Luther King Jr., but now it's time to think again. Dr. Martin will be visiting the University of Montana on January 26th as part of the President's Lecture Series. And since this event is a key part of our Martin Luther King Day celebrations, I'm also joined today by our Director of African American Studies and History Professor, Dr. Tobin miller Shearer. Lerone, Tobin, thanks for coming on the show today. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with you. So let's start, as we always do, with where did you grow up and what did your parents do? Lerone, why don't you start? I grew up in a tiny uh, town in Northwest Ohio by the name of Fostoria, Ohio, a town of about 17,000 people. And both of my parents uh, worked in factories that made auto parts uh, for Detroit, which is um, very close, about maybe 70 miles away. For as a child of two factory workers, give us the kind of short form version of how you decided to become an academic. I am the youngest of uh, five, and I was, let's say, I, I'm going to use the phrase my siblings used, annoying. <laughs> <laughs> the annoying younger sibling who was always asking questions about why. Yes. So I was always a curious kid and about why certain things happened and uh, what, you know, what was involved, what became before it. And so I was a horrible uh, kid to watch a movie with because I was constantly asking questions about why. Sure. And as I got older and it went through high school, I had some great teachers who really, you know, were telling me, you know, the questions you're asking are actually more historical or questions that deserve further research. And, you know, there are opportunities for you to do that. And thankfully, I had some teachers in high school and college to encourage me to move forward and to think about a life of the mind and engaging in research. I initially thought I was going to go into the ministry. So after college, I went to seminary. I went to Princeton Theological Seminary. And I think it was there is where I discovered that what I really found joy in and felt a sense of calling to was actually um, teaching as opposed to being um, in the church and in being in the ministry. Super. Well, some some certain parallels between your background and uh, Tobin's background. Tobin, let's start with where did you grow up and what did your parents do? So I was born in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Grew up mostly in southern Ontario and northeast Pennsylvania. Was the firstborn son of three sons. My dad is a Mennonite minister, was for many years. My mother worked in a variety of church positions, and then from that went on to work as a counselor. That's where my dad ended up as well, in uh, mostly northeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah, and you came to academia kind of as a second career of the mm-hmm. sort? Yeah. yeah, I worked for about 15 years in the nonprofit sector, most of that situated in the Mennonite community through Mennonite Central Committee, doing anti-racism work, and then did a mid-career shift, went to graduate school, and ended up here at University of Montana. Let's maybe talk about the premise of your visit, part of our Martin Luther King Day celebrations. You are a scholar of Dr. King. Why are we still studying Dr. Martin Luther King? What are, what are we learning? What's new to uncover? I would say two things. The first is somewhat unfortunate, which is that his words and his work and his philosophy are still so very relevant today. Mm. And there's part of part of us that should be concerned about that, that some of the things that he spoke about, worked towards, and um, constantly advocated for is still very relevant today, whether that's police brutality, whether that's um, inequality, racism, war, all these things are still very relevant today. So in some sense, King is never out of style because his his words and the things that he was concerned about are still so relevant today. I think the second reason why it's still important to study him is because King is kind of this individual that everybody thinks they know, Mm -hmm. but they don't. You know, he's the only individual that is not that is not a president but yet has a statue on the national mall and that kind of 
familiarity that he has or omnipresence in our culture, I think gives people a false sense of knowing uh, Martin King. But there's so much more to him than just the I have a dream speech that is lionized year after year. King cared about racism, certainly, but he also cared about war, cared about violence, he cared about poverty. So I think there's so much more for us to explore in Martin Luther King's ideas and the things that he believed in. And I think he's such a rich treasure trove. One of the things, Lerone, that I so appreciate in the comments you just made and what I know of your broader work is that you and your colleagues at Stanford's King Center have been very deliberately positioning yourselves to be sure that we're not engaging in this pacification of King, the erasure of his radicalism that Vincent Harding and others have pointed out for us. Can you say a little bit about that dynamic and culture where someone reaches the stature that King has reached, in the process gets a bit removed from the very challenging things they were saying during the time that they were alive? Yes. Um, you know, part of that, I think, in some ways is can be traced to the passage of the of the MLK holiday. And that is while the Reagan administration at the time vigorously fought against the passage of an MLK holiday, I think the Reagan administration eventually flips and decides to sign the holiday into law. And in doing so, from the very beginning, the Reagan administration was very savvy in trying to package the holiday in Martin Luther King as a celebration of the American dream. And that Martin Luther King Jr. simply wanted people to pursue the American dream and that he was solely interested in inspiring people to be successful in America and not someone who was inspiring people to take a look at some of the uh, social structures in our country that prevented people from being human and being successful and living a life of of quality and a a life from a lack of want. And I think from the very beginning, the holiday was been packaged in a way that defangs him or anesthetizes his legacy in a way that prevents us from seeing how he called America into question, both in his life, but also even from the grave. Seems like that's a pattern in history, certainly with leaders, but with stories. We kind of um, shade out the nuance, we erase the flaws in some ways, in this case, you know, erasing some of the radicalism or trying to um, soften that. When we do that, we lose a lot of the humanity of a person, of a story, uh, and so forth. So how does the overall humanity of, of, of King get lost in the narrative sometimes? You know, I, I think that's such an important point. One thing that comes to mind, um, Clarence Jones, who was King's personal attorney, and one of the things that he has mentioned is that there was a point in time because of all the pressure Martin was under, both in terms of just the civil rights movement and the protest and the violence he was enduring, the violence he was seeing his community endure, but also even the pressure that was put on him by the FBI. The FBI was engaged in a campaign to discredit Martin Luther King Jr. They were sending out intelligence against him to various government agencies and in the military as a, as a form of counterintelligence. And in the midst of all this stress and strain, Clarence shared that they took Martin to a physician and the physician said that Martin was completely exhausted and that he, this man, and this is a quote, this man needs to see a psychiatrist. Martin and Clarence and those around him basically said, no, you know, it's, he can't. We've got to find another way because we're concerned that the FBI could possibly get a hold of the physician's notes and use it against him. And so you just think about the kind of strain a human being is under, number one. And then number two, even the remedies that one would seek to alleviate one's condition, right? Even those are foreclosed as a result of one's decision to stand up and speak truth to power. So I think when we when we think about Martin King, the, the statue, the holiday, we think of this mythic hero. And in many ways he was. 
but we lose track of the very human element and the toll that it took upon him because he decided to stand up and speak truth to power. Given your new work on Hoover, Lerone, is there anything you discovered in your new research that helps us understand that whole FBI assessment and interventions, whether under the COINTELPRO label or otherwise, that has us reevaluate those pressures that King was under? What we've known for several years now is the effort to the extent to which they went to in, in terms of to discredit him, as you stated, Tobin, to embarrass him and to, to help to, to force him to lose any kind of social or moral authority in the public eye. I think what I was able to discover, which was a shock to me, was the extent to which the FBI was also trying to convince other ministers to come out against Martin Luther King Jr. Wow. And one in particular, um, the Reverend Lightfoot Solomon Mashal was a well-known radio preacher. He was the first minister, black or white, to have his own television show beginning in the late 1940s in Washington, D.C. Had a very large following. And the FBI partnered with him, feeding him intel about Martin Luther King Jr. being a communist and Martin Luther King Jr. being bent on uh, subverting um, um, the country and, and helping the Russians and, and, and other groups who were trying to the America thought terrorized the country, that they partnered with him and gave him intel. And he used that intel to preach sermons and to write open letters to the press and to write letters to the White House claiming that King was not a real minister and that he was a fraud. And I think that that level of detail, that level of coverage to try to shape government opinion in the halls of power, but then also to try to shape public opinion makers I think that to, was the, the, the biggest shock that I think I discovered in my own research, that the extent to which the Bureau would go to try to really destroy Martin and his credibility, and thereby, they thought, the civil rights movement as a whole. Yeah, this probably is a good time to highlight that work and this upcoming book that you have. The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover should be out in, in hopefully in a month or so. Talk about this work because it does it broadens the lens to include the civil rights movement more generally and the rise of Christian nationalism and the role of the FBI in that rise. What, what I try to do in the book is show the way that a white Christian nationalism was really influential in shaping the modern FBI. We've often thought about the FBI as having an antagonistic relationship to religion because we know of their work to discredit and surveil religious groups, both Protestant and Catholic. We haven't thought much about what kind of religious faith did the FBI actually like. So we know what kind of religious faith communities they didn't like, those advocating for change, Mennonites, you know, Catholics such as Dorothy Day and others. But we haven't thought much about what kind of faith communities did they embrace. And in my research, through the Freedom of Information Act, as well as even um, a, a lawsuit to the Department of Justice to obtain FBI records, I was able to discover that the FBI had a very fruitful partnership with um, white evangelicals, especially the intellectual mainframe, if you will, of white evangelicalism by, with Billy Graham and Carl F.H. Henry and, and Nelson Bell and others who are really at the forefront of building a modern white evangelicalism. And the FBI partnered with them to launder intel, but also to have J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, uh, become a contributor to Christianity Today. The FBI distributed essays and content from Christianity Today as a way to, while trying to discredit Martin King, to try to give a kind of credence and authority to white evangelicalism, as the rightful faith of the United States of America and as the moral custodian of America. And I think we've seen that over and over again with white evangelical brothers and sisters rallying around political figures who fall far short of their stated moral and theological commitments, but yet they still rally around them. And what I've found is that that is a, a repeating theme within white evangelicalism. And if that history is not unearthed and really confronted, then the movement will be bound to repeat it over and over and over again. I want to make a connection here, Lerone, and hear your response. 
because I think it connects to the larger arguments you're asking your readers to explore and be confronted with. So we know from many scholars that within, in particular, the white evangelical community, there is an emphasis on interpersonal solutions to the problem of race in America and racism more writ large, rather than systemic solutions. So in what you've just described to us, we have a member of the FBI being courted by a community that sees the solutions to the problem of racism in an individual frame. And then you've got King, who despite living out sort of notions of respectability, which would suggest to us aren't as challenging to notions of white supremacy and the underlying institutional racism in this country, but yet is talking about systemic solutions to the problem of racism. So I'm just wondering how you see that working itself out in particular in this kind of connection between white evangelicals and Hoover. Is this connected to that fundamental disconnect within the community between relational solutions versus King systemic solutions? You're exactly right. Hoover and some, and, and, and I, and I quote this in the book, Hoover has some comments he makes that were supposed to be off the record comments to a group of reporters and one of the things that he talks about is um, he, he has this moderate stance and evangelicals called it the evangelical moderate stance, that they believe that those who are advocating for laws to bring about integration were wrong, but those who were engaging in white supremacist violence were also wrong. And that the solution was somewhere in the middle, as you just stated, Tobin, that it's about interpersonal relationships, that if folks just give their lives to Jesus, have a conversion experience, mm-hmm and live lives as good citizens, eventually racism will fade away. Hoover articulated this to a group of reporters by simply saying, if African Americans would basically get their act together, eventually they'll gain the right to have rights that are equal to white citizens. And so it's for some reason with Hoover, it was this idea that it was, as you said, interpersonal, right? That it's as long as African Americans conduct themselves appropriately, then eventually they'll get their rights. That King was advocating for something that African Americans were just simply not morally and virtue and weren't virtuous enough, and they weren't ready for it. They weren't morally ready. They they were not simply mentally, psychologically, and spiritually ready. But yet, when you ask the question about why is it that white citizens, apparently from birth, Mr. Hoover, apparently they are just ready for this automatically but yet African-Americans have to work towards it. But you're absolutely right. That question was not usually asked of Mr. Hoover publicly and white evangelicals as a whole. And that's where the connection was, that the belief in this interpersonal um, relationship with Jesus and individual moral performance would somehow eventually wipe away racism by helping African-Americans to become ready for full citizenship. We'll be back to my conversation with Lerone Martin and Tobin miller Shearer after this short break. A New Angle is supported by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and UM's College of Business. Access to capital, broadband, and education are three ingredients any community needs for success. Hey folks, Accelerate Montana and the Women's Entrepreneurship and Leadership Lab have created eight online micro courses designed to provide current and aspiring women business owners real world solutions to your business problems. These courses are practical and hands-on and will give you skills and capabilities you can put to work on your business right away. Courses include topics such as managing finances, how to create value for your customers and pivoting your business. For more information on each course and how to register, visit wellwbc.org slash microcourses. That's wellwbc.org slash microcourses. Hi, this is Anya Jabor, Regents Professor of History at the University of Montana, and you are listening to A New Angle. Welcome back to A New Angle. We're discussing the legacy of Martin Luther King with Lerone Martin and Tobin miller Shearer. So, In our remaining time, Lerone, I'd love to sort of bring this conversation to the present day to the extent possible. You know, we're kind of living through the kind of aftermath of COVID, however you want to describe it, the murder of George Floyd, the rise of Black Lives Matter, and and kind of this 
moment where the conversation has shifted in the last few years. It's a conversation that's been ongoing, obviously, but it's acquired a new salience on campus, in the discourse in general. How do you view the role of King's legacy in forming this kind of renewed salience of, of race in our culture right now? You know, King's ideas, he often summed them up, particularly in the last bit of his life, as that America was facing um, the evil triplets or three evils. And those three evils were uh, racism, poverty, and militarism or war. And I think that King showed how those three things, he called them triplets because he saw them as interrelated. And the way that racism brings about um, inequality and poverty in America, and the way that America was spending billions of dollars on wars, both at home and abroad, but yet couldn't find enough resources to alleviate racism and poverty in this country. And I think if we still consider King's formulation of the evil triplets, I think it can help us move forward today in all that ails our democracy. In King's, one of his probably the most famous address to the public, right, is probably the I Have a Dream speech. But even in that speech, which is often, right, frozen with the, the talk about King dreaming of a day where his little girls will be judged by the, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. But in the previously parts of that speech, he talks about poverty. And he also even brings up police brutality, about violence. So King was on the cutting edge of these things, even in the 60s. So I think that he's still relevant today. And I think that if we can think about and follow his formulation of the evil triplets, we can think about how we can solve some of the problems that ail our democracy in a way that doesn't isolate issues, that doesn't just simply say, okay, well, if we can get rid of police brutality, then we can, we can simply, we can remove it and it won't be a problem anymore. But I think King's formulation would challenge us to say that it's going to be difficult to get rid of police brutality if we don't actually deal with racism. And it's going to be difficult to get rid of poverty if we don't deal with racism and militarism and war and so forth and so on. So I think if we can move forward with his ideas of the interrelatedness of some of the problems that ail our democracy, I think they will bear great fruit. And what advice would you have for students, anybody listening who, who kind of wants to just edu one, educate themselves more in this space, become a part of solutions, become a better citizen of the values of which you speak here. But it does seem we're living through a time where it's easier to police thought within ideological groups than it is to bring people together across ideological groups. How, how do you kind of think about that moment we're in and helping students and, and other folks figure out how to have more productive conversation? I would say, and this is what I tell my students, is to try to think about historical figures and for our conversation, Martin Luther King Jr. as a conversation partner. So with someone whose ideas mm -hmm. you're going to read, consume, digest, think about, and then try to take that, those ideas into the world. And this is not to say that King's ideas are a blueprint to fix everything necessarily, but he is a conversation partner to help us to think through the problems that we confront today. So, for example, we know that Martin Luther King Jr. actually spoke to people who disagreed with him, whether that was the FBI, local police sheriffs, whether it was white supremacist groups. King tried his best before there was any efforts to protest, before there were any efforts to boycott. There was actual conversation and negotiation. And I think that's a part that's left off about Martin Luther King Jr. is that he did engage and talk to people who disagreed with him. I think that's something that we've lost in our public conversations today. But I think King can serve as a conversation partner by also looking at King as someone whose ideas bared great fruit, but not to allow his heroic status to blind us from our own genius. We can't allow King's heroic, st heroic status to blind us from our own genius today. But we need to also look at King's principles and what he was fighting for and why he was using a march or why he was using a boycott. And maybe then that can inspire us to think about solutions for our own problems. 
That is wonderful wisdom and guidance for, for our audience. Thank you. You know, as we close here, we should uh, reiterate the name of your upcoming book. I think you said it releases on the 7th of February. The title is The Gospel of J. Edgar Hoover, How the FBI Aided and Abetted the Rise of White Christian Nationalism. Any tips on where we'll be able to find it, all the places, or is it selling through specific outlets? All the places, wherever books are sold near you, um, it'll be in, and hopefully it'll be in all the places, but certainly Princeton University Press, the website there. Um, and local booksellers, Barnes and Nobles, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. I guess I have one final question. Tobin, you might have one as well, but you know, you probably get asked to speak all around the world. Uh, why did you say yes to Montana? Well, I thought it was a wonderful opportunity to engage in st- uh, students. I'm really excited about the next generation of folks. I'm always looking forward to engaging um, young adults in, on college campuses because they are our future. And they are living at a time that's unprecedented in terms of the technology and communication. Um, Martin King could not have imagined a world uh, of the Internet, how we're speaking right now or um, social media. And so I think we're living at a time that is unprecedented. And I think young adults are going to be the ones to lead us into the future and there are hope for, you know, for a better day. I'll um, cite something that Martin King said here in his Nobel Peace Prize lecture, not his acceptance speech, but his actual lecture. And he talked about how technology in the 1960s, this is 1964, how technology had just exploded. He said that we've learned how to fly in the air like birds, swim in the uh, ocean like fish, but yet we haven't learned the simple act of living together as brothers. And he said that our moral progress has not kept up with our technological progress. And I think that's a message even from 1964 that we can bring to young adults today. How are we going to make sure that our moral progress as a community, as a country, how are we going to make sure that our moral progress matches up to the fast speed of our technological progress? And that's what I'm excited to to engage the students there Uh, at the University of Montana. And uh, I'm really excited, looking forward to to coming to campus. Yeah, what an important time for that message to come across. Tobin, any last questions for Dr. Martin? Someone who's thinking about coming to your lecture, what's your one sentence teaser about why someone should come and hear you talk about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? You think you know Martin Luther King Jr., but now it's time to think again. I nice. Like it. Perfect. That, that was tight. It's almost like you workshopped it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, the title of the talk, the presidential lecture series talk is Becoming King, How a Wavering Teenager Became a Global Icon. It's at 730 on January 26th at the Ally Auditorium. It's also available on Zoom. For more information and to register, visit umt.edu slash president. Dr. Martin, it's been a pleasure to speak with you, to get your message out there, to preview your talk. Uh, look forward to the opportunity to meet you in person, and we're really grateful and excited that you're going to be visiting with us in a couple of weeks. Thanks for having me. I can't wait to be there. I can't wait to see you all in person in 3D. That's right. It'll be great. Looking forward to seeing you here. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a generous gift from UM alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. A New Angle is presented by First Security Bank, Blackfoot Communications, and the University of Montana College of Business. With additional support from Consolidated Electrical Distributors, Drum Coffee, and Montana Public Radio. Keely Larson is our producer. VTO, Jeff Amet, and John Wicks made our music. Editing by Nick Mott, social media by AJ Williams, and Jeff Neese is our master of all things sound. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.